Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Mark Stouffer Hunter here with the History Center. We are so thrilled and so delighted to have all of you here for our second edition of Oral, Oral Histories Live. Uh, tonight we're speaking with Ann Lipsky, our honored guest tonight. And we thank you so much for supporting the History Center and being here this evening. Uh, Ann is synonymous with Smulikoff's furniture store history here in Cedar Rapids. Uh, one of the truly great uh, landmark history stories of the community. Uh, starting in 1889, uh, originally located on Mays Island as a very small island furniture store, then located on 3rd Avenue Southwest until establishing an iconic location at 3rd Avenue and 1st Street that many of us remember uh, starting in 1942. So without further ado, we'll get going. Glad to have you here. I'd like to uh, introduce our host, the wonderful Rob Klein. You're not managing expectations oh, well. Thank you. Let me uh, repeat what Mark said. We're so glad that you're all here. We're glad that there are many Smulikoff's employees here to keep Ann honest. That's important. <laughs> um, some of you may know my day job. I'm the marketing director at Hancher Auditorium. And one of the things that that entails is I get to read all the artist contracts. And uh, Ann's artist contract requires a rock band everywhere she goes. <laughs> <laughs> Artists are like that. So, uh, we apologize, uh, unless you like the music, and then we're delighted to bring it to you. Um, all right, a couple of housekeeping things. We're going to do sort of a, a, a little chat among the three of us, and then we'll open it up to questions, uh, and we will lie as little as possible. Before we get started, I should welcome one other guest, the legendary Cedar Rapids photographer, George Henry, is with us tonight. George has lived through many, many things, including being the first victim of Oral Histories Live. If you missed that event, uh, we did record it. You can watch it on the web. Is it up on your website yet? Yes. Yes, yes. you can watch it at historycenter.org. It is delightful. Mm -hmm. No, really, it is. All right. And this one will also be put up online because, you know, we want to save these, part of the purpose of this activity is saving these stories uh, for the future. So, and we're so grateful that you're here tonight. Now, Mark told us a little bit about the history of the store, but I thought we might start there. We might start with Henry and talk about the path to the location that we all think of as Lacoste. Mm -hmm. Well, I can tell you a little bit about about the history of Smulikovs. Most of the people here can tell you the same amount or more. They may have better stories, I don't know. Um, and I know you also have recorded my mother and my grandmother yes. telling stories about uh, the history of Smulikovs. We'll be comparing. But, yes, or see, see if it's two out of three or we all agree. Right, right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's start at the beginning. Tell, tell me a little bit about Henry and, and his, when, when we talked together in sort of a pre-interview, we really do plan, it, it's true. Uh, it was almost a rehearsal. Tell me a little bit about, I was struck when you said that the story of Smulikovs is a, is a story that you could find across the Midwest. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, at the time that Henry came over to this country, uh, there was a, a great migration of people from the area that I guess we currently would know as sort of Ukraine, that Lithuania, the, the, the uh, the area around there, and he was one of many that came, uh, came out to Iowa because he had a cousin of a cousin of a cousin that lived in Quasquaden. So Cedar Rapids was as close as he could get. Uh, he, I think, like many, he came with no money, got a job in New Jersey, worked until he had enough money to get a train as far as I believe Cedar Rapids, and then uh, began his his business as a peddler walked the area uh, until he could find a store. And I know this is true. There was, there was one person who would go to each different town and they dispersed I, all over the Midwest for sure, but I think all over the country as well. You can hear this kind of a story. Founded a little furniture store, a dry goods store, or something like that. Uh, he he uh, found a furniture store, uh, bought it so that he could get married and uh, that was the beginning of the island store. Uh, stayed there until he went to uh, the Smulikov store on the west side. Uh, 
which is under where the, the red brick annex is that used to be part of Wells Fargo, that, the big sort of barn-like structure uh, made out of brick. That, there was a, uh, the Smulikoff's West Side store was there. Then in 1942 moved to the store on the, on the east side, uh, which was originally just the five-story building later on added what we called uh, the, the two-story building, the annex. And uh, I believe some of the people here were present at that <laughs> creation. Uh, and that, that's where we ended up. We lasted 125 years. That was... Uh, I think that's one of the most amazing things that, that I've learned through this process, the idea that the store started on Mays Island, which you know, we think of as the seat of government, we think of as uh, unique nearly unique in the world in terms of having our city government there. Um, but, the, but the store started on the island. How, what would have caused the move to the west side? Uh, it was the desire to make it a, a city island that, that uh, caused Henry to move over to the west side. They asked him to move and he did. So I, I think he was, they, they bought his property and he, he moved over there. But, and I think at that time that was the vital uh, retail area of okay of uh, Cedar Rapids. Well, and I think that's interesting too. Now, there, I don't know if you know, there, there's sometimes a little rivalry east and west in this town. The, the small one. Uh, <laughs> what, what brought him from the west side uh, uh, to this side, to the other side? The younger generation, it was uh, his sons that made that move. Uh, it was a, 1942, they needed, a, Henry was long gone by then. They decided they wanted to be in a bigger store, and it had been a furniture store right before mm -hmm. uh, the, building. the building had. So it seemed like an opportune moment, and they were expanding. It was uh, uh, something that they wanted to do. I don't know whether Henry would have done it or not. He surely would have approved. Uh, but that was their decision. All right. So let's jump forward quite a bit. Let's talk about the flood of 2008. <laughs> you're, like you're missing the like flood to, of 29. Like sort of ease into things, so we're going to go right to the flood of 2008. Uh, we're, I'm interested in the, the kind of damage the building underwent, and then there's a, a fascinating recovery story, right? That tells uh, a little bit about you, that. You missed the flood of 29, which was family legend, mm -hmm. but my, my mother did remember that. Mm. And there's probably something in her recorded history about, about that. Uh, we, we, we spent our entire existence as a store within three blocks of where we were. So this was, 2008 was not the only flood. I can remember a flood when I was young, and I don't know which one it was. It, that would not have been 29. Fair um, enough. I, I remember <laughs> at the time we had, uh, we sold uh, boats, mm -hmm. like I guess just little rowboats and dinghy kind of things. And I remember going down to the basement and seeing them floating there. <laughs> I do remember that was That's dramatic, a, a and I do remember kind of preparedness. It. Uh, <laughs> apparently so. Apparently so. Um, uh, but in the flood of 2008, we didn't have a whole lot of warning. We did what we could to, to save as much as we could. Um, uh, one of my employees stayed in the building as long as was humanly possible, and then some. Um, uh, barely got out in time, in my humble opinion. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he thought he had plenty of time, Dennis. And... <laughs> uh, we'll let you speak for yourself later. No, we won't. No <laughs> chance. Um, uh, we were under a fair amount of water. Um, luckily for us, we were in a very old building, so we were in no danger of being uh, damaged by the, the actual flood. Uh, the building survived quite nicely mm -hmm. and it dried out. Um, again, luckily for us, uh, because we were so old, our power came in on the second floor and came down instead of to electronics to good old fashioned copper, which, <laughs> which, the, which they dried out and cleaned up and turned us on. I believe we were the first people to get back into business mm -hmm. uh, after the flood. And, uh, we were, we were very lucky in that regard. It's sort of amazing to think that the saving grace was in fact the age of the building Absolutely. and the age, the age of the, of the, the copper wires and the, the equipment. Yeah. Electronics remarkable. would have been history. Was there any, I have to think, I, I know this from my experience at Hancher and the flooding out of that facility, yeah. was there any moment where you thought, you know what, 
we're just going to close. We're going we're to cut our losses and, and be done. Uh, there was a, quite a few moments when I thought we weren't going to have any choice. First of all, I wasn't sure they were going to let us back into the building. They kept telling us that we couldn't do this. Finally, we stopped listening to the rules. And once we stopped that, things looked a lot better. I, had, <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> if you work for FEMA, please <laughs> pretend you didn't hear that. <laughs> we were very lucky. We had a lot of employees that came in and helped us, mm -hmm. um, helped us with the, to, with the cleanup, helped us with the restoration of things. People came over to my house and operated. Uh, we had a very interesting uh, finance department. Uh, not only were we out of business, our bank was as well. So we didn't have any way to do trivial things like, oh, pay bills. Oh, oh, it, Even after a flood, people still like to have their, their invoices filled. It's true. They do, they're very picky. Yeah, they are. It's true. It is true. So we had some adventures in all kinds of ways. So. Hmm. So then in 2014, 125 years into the history of the mm -hmm. store, the decision is made to, to call it a day. Tell me a little bit about that. Um, we had been participating with the discussions with the Corps of Engineers. And um, it turns out that when people want to go to a retail store or to most commercial enterprises, they don't want to stop going there for a couple of years and wait till the building gets repaired. And it turns out that all of the possible choices for repair, we were told, were going to impact our building directly. And I didn't think we were going to be able to operate during the however many years it was going to take for them to make all the alterations in the walls and the bridges and whatever. But they were coming right into the building and they said that would be fine, we could just close for however long that turned out to be and reopen. I didn't think that was going to work too well. Um, so we, we, they, they offered us the opportunity to get out of the building, so we did. We, I didn't feel we had any options, and it turned out to be 125 years, and that was, I, that was a, I, we thought that was a good way to go. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so there's sort of a, a broad look at the, the history of, of the, the store and of the building and of its various weather-related, I tell you what, that band is loud. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'd turn them down if I could. Um, but now that we've done sort of that overview, let, let's talk about your family a little. Let's start with your dad. Let's, let's, let's talk about Abbott. Uh, my first note is that uh, you have some stories about him on the phone with, with customers. I'm interested in sort of the, the Smulikov's approach to customer service. Uh oh, this is a dangerous subject. For, if any of you are here <clears throat> because you're interested in that, um, if it's a mattress and uh, body impression you have, Dennis is here and he'll direct you where to go. <laughs> if it's a refrigerator or washer issue, uh, Mike Grover is here and he can give you a phone number. And if it was <laughs> the olden days, you would have called my father mm -hmm. at home, presumably 9 or 10 o'clock at night, and said that your refrigerator had failed and you just so happened to have put $532 worth of beef in it for the great party you were supposed to have in two days and it was all defrosted and it was going to be ruined and asked my father what exactly he was prepared to do about it. <laughs> what was your father prepared to do about it? Well, he had a couple of options depending on the exact time and space or whatever. He would either offer to come and bring you some type of refrigeration equipment or he would offer if you brought him any kind of documentation, including a fierce temper, um, he would replace it for you. But he, that I can remember many times that somebody calling, my mother saying, we were eating dinner, and they say, no, this is an emergency. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just, oh dear, and that now, was what he did. It's interesting, when, when you first told me that story, I thought, wow, it, it's so good that here in 2018, we don't do business that way anymore. But uh, I can tell you that I manage the Hancher Facebook page, and we do business just like that now, right? <laughs> it's 11.30. Someone needs to know what time the show is three months from now, <laughs> right? So this sort of entitlement that customers mm -hmm. sometimes Customer. feel around businesses. That's right. It's That's interesting. Right. Hmm. So when he wasn't fending off 
customers mm -hmm. politely and, and mm -hmm. solving their problems. He was also a, a, a huge advocate for downtown and for the importance of, of a city core. Talk a little about that. He, he was very involved in the downtown movement along with a few other key individuals, but he really believed in it. He thought that being downtown was the greatest way to be, uh, that, that this was the heart of the city and this was what made it all work. And uh, he was involved in the original Greater Downtown organizations and uh, everything he could think of. This was his idea of what to do. I once suggested to him that we should diversify our holdings a little bit. He was furious. He, t <laughs> he told me I hadn't been here very long and I didn't know anything. <laughs> I was mm. <laughs> one of the he few knew times. He were related, right? <laughs> uh, apparently not. He was wondering uh, <laughs> where been exactly. Been here very long. <laughs> Where exactly did I get this crazy notion? So, uh, no, he, this is what he believed in. This is what he did. He moved here right after the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And when he was here, that was it. Mm -hmm. It's here to stay. Hmm. And as part of that, some of the things that he was able to do is, is bring essential services into downtown, things that you wouldn't necessarily think of as occurring at a furniture store, like uh, the opportunity to get your driver's license at Smulikovs. Tell me oh, about that. He thought that, that was wonderful. He, he, he was not a person who began driving at an early age. He was from Chicago. So he thought this was the most exotic and interesting and wonderful mm -hmm. thing to do. Um, not that he loved driving all the time, but mm -hmm. uh, he, he just thought this was fascinating that you would bring these services into into the store. He wanted people to come to the store for everything. Mm -hmm. if, he, if he could have thought of more things, he mm -hmm. would have done more things. Uh, but he, he just enjoyed having it. He always, of course, forgot to get his license till the last minute. So <laughs> I suspect it came in handy at least once. Mm -hmm. So it was really just a convenience for him. That's smart. I like that. Yeah. Anybody here get a driver's license at, at, at Smulikovs? Huh. It's fascinating. Yeah. So he was also interested in, in keeping as much of the operation in-house. He right? kept all of the operation mm -hmm. in-house. We had our own service department, we had our own trucks, we had our own warehouse, we had our own everything. And at a time when everyone else, thinking correctly, diversified all of that and sold off their accounts and did everything, um, we kept it all. And in fact, we still are in the finance business, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which is where his roots were. Mm -hmm. I think he'd be pleased, at least I hope he'd be pleased to know that we kept our accounts and we still have them. So if any of you didn't pay. <laughs> 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 Anne's or, taking names. I, I, I just want to be clear, <laughs> neither Mark nor I will be making warranties right, <laughs> nor will we be attempting to collect on your bills. No, so no. That's outside our... Yeah. <laughs> but. Mm -hmm. uh, this advocacy for downtown, this desire mm -hmm. to bring everything downtown, he passes away just before the flood of 2008, is that right? Yes, he did, uh, right before, he, he passed away about two weeks before the flood. Um, at the time he died, uh, we were having a great dispute. We had one last piece of property that we needed to rent, and there were uh, a number of people contending for it. Two weeks later, not so much. I am <laughs> <laughs> One of the consequences of having all the property that you own in downtown is when a flood like this came, it struck every piece mm -hmm. of property that he owned and or had any interest in whatsoever. And so I don't think it would have been pleasant. Um, my mother thought he would have known what to do. Mm -hmm. I expect he would have. We were left to muddle through. Uh, it was oh, He died on May 28th. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the flood came June shortly thereafter. <laughs> but even in the in the face of that, he would have wanted he would have wanted to keep everything downtown. Oh yes, right? everything. Well, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Huh. You can't let a little thing like water get in your way. Yeah. <laughs> Fair. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. All right. You mentioned your mom, Joan. Mm -hmm. um, we have a number of things to talk about. She's one of the was one of the first female legislators in the state. Mm -hmm. uh, you called her a Rockefeller Republican. That's Rockefeller Republican. Uh, for those from of you back scoring in the day, home, for those of you who have not. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about her political career. Her political career uh, resulted, she was a, 
while, while she was having children grow up, she was sort of the club woman mm -hmm. and was involved in many, many local things that, that were of interest to her. Um, the art museum was of particular interest to her, but everything was of interest to her. If it had human beings in it, it was interesting. And uh, she was kind of recruited into politics at a difficult time and uh, not unlike the time we're going through right now, uh, when people were polarized and there was a lot of action. Um, she was in a way disgusted and someone recruited her and said, if you don't come, if people like you don't get into politics, who will? That was good enough for her. And so she received the backing of many, uh, obviously local men, there weren't many active women, and uh, ran for office and it turned out that she loved it. Uh, ran uh, for many years until she began to become interested in going to law school as a consequence of her experiences in the legislature. Became a lawyer, um, interested in administrative law, and uh, figured she wouldn't have any grandchildren, she might as well have something to do. That was, that was the end of that. She then had seven grandchildren right away. So. <laughs> I think that, that's it interesting, right? Sense. A, a politician mm -hmm. uh, who then becomes a lawyer. That's so right, backwards. Sort of the other way. And, and where did she study law? In the University of Iowa. Oh. Mm -hmm. As well you should. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, You've heard of that. Another check mark for yeah. me. <laughs> for Joan. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but speaking of colleges, she, did, she spent 25 years she, at, at Co. Uh, with I, I like how you put it to us that, that she believed that promoting Co. was equivalent to promoting Cedar Rapids at large. Yes, yeah, she believed that, that Cedar Rapids needed a, a, some kind of an educational institution and needed to make sure it was secure and had, and it had intellectual justification. And uh, she really felt that was very, very important. Um, just, just like she believed it was essentially like my father's belief in downtown, which by the way, he believed downtown went to 19th Street on the east side. So he yeah. just. That was probably good, yeah. all things considered. All things considered. <laughs> Get everything mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. I like Included that. the whole thing, yeah. And and I'm, am I correct in saying she was the first female board chair at Co? Yes, she was. She had the backing of a couple of the people at Co that wanted to, uh, I guess we call it diversify. She wanted to, to have a women running things that she believed that they were going to do just a fine job, and uh, she was the first one, to, the first female board chair there. She, being a part of the board was one of the most fulfilling things that she did. She, she was very pleased with that. Well, I think you, you told us that when your mom said we, mm -hmm. she meant co-college. She meant co-college, yeah. yeah. Oh. And in fact, we went on a, uh, I, I have just come back from a, a trip on the Green River in Utah, a rafting trip that George Henry took us on uh, 30 odd years ago with my mother and she said, we are going on a trip with all of our friends. It was people from Co. <laughs> that, were, that were going. And I remember the discussions late at night around the fire, around whatever, were all about Co. My children, of course, had no idea what we were talking about, um, having been us five and seven at the time. But it, that was her idea of, of a congenial group, was uh, co-trustees and co-faculty, co everything about Cope. All right. Well, let's talk about you now Let, uh, and, and your time uh, running Ulikoff. Mm -hmm. One mm -hmm. of the things you told us about was, the, and you've alluded to it a little here tonight already, the, the notion that you all decided to grow in place. Yes. What's good? What's bad? What would you do different? Well, the decision really was made for us by the time I came, mm -hmm. we were a very large store, uh, and of, of course, we're in an area which is largish but not that close to a major city, so competing with ourselves by establishing another store was really not something we were in a position to do. Um, many years ago, they had thought about that and decided that we were so unique that people would come to us not sure that what decision they would make if they were starting over again. And I'm not sure what I would do if I was making that decision back in the 50s or whenever. But I, I think this is the one they felt comfortable with. And so they did it. There are advantages and disadvantages. 
um, I don't have to worry about what uh, all the uh, the internet is doing right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so, so the idea was, was a, a destination, destination store. Destination store. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, and, and we've talked about this a little bit, but what's leadership like when your business is underwater, right? What 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 were your day-to-day -day tasks? How did you make? How do you put the stress aside enough to make? smart decisions, what was that process like? Oh, I didn't have to worry about that. I had plenty of people to help me with the smart decision making. <laughs> I, I'm just going to let that go. <laughs> <laughs> I had lots of people, I had lots of uh, people that worked in the store to help, and I had lots of people who had worked in the store, and then I had people who felt they could help me do, with all of my decision making process. So it was a kind of a committee thing. Mm -hmm. um, we always got some kind of consensus from the people. Uh, I, I tried to not send anybody over the edge that was having to show up to work every day. I don't know if I was always successful, but um, that was what we did. We, everybody knew a little bit about the way the whole thing worked, and most people knew a great deal about how their area worked. One of the things that made us a little bit different as a store was it was old-fashioned in the sense that there was a lot of detail to know, that people had to, rather than just selecting from a short list of items, there was a great deal of merchandise they had to understand. And so they tended to stay there a long time. We used to say people retired at least once, usually twice. And that <laughs> if you, by the, for after your first 10 years, you were really kind of starting to know your way around. So um, there was just a lot to know. And so when you turn to somebody who works with that kind of merchandise, it's not just saying, oh, yeah, I sold five green ones. You know, it's, it's something a little bit better than that. So right. it's a whole hmm. different world. OK, so I'm a marketing guy, and I have the microphone. So I want to talk about advertising. <laughs> um, first, I'd like to just as a, could you, could you as, as, a, as an assembled choir, could, could, you, could you sing the jingle for me? Oh, Mark's going to yeah. sing it. He's going to lead. OK, are you ready? We all saw this and heard this on television. I'm going to lead first, and then you're going to join me the second time, OK? Smula Coffs, downtown Cedar Rapids. All of us, let's go. Come on. Smula Coffs, downtown Cedar Rapids. Da -da -da. Uh, OK. That's I was it. worried about you for a second there. So we we had I had a, a, a coworker who lived in Iowa City and uh, he he was trying to figure out something about Cedar Rapids and he knew that I lived up here and he said Rob I don't know a damn thing about your town but my daughters can tell you that Smulikovs is in downtown Cedar Rapids, Cedar Rapids. <laughs> right so I that's a pretty good. Good advertising, right? And I, I'm, I'm interested. We, we were talking about how everything was handled in house, but your creative, I, my, my dad is here. My dad for many years worked mm -hmm. at Cresswell Munsell, Fultz, and Serbel. Yeah. They never got the Smulikovs account because you handled that all in house. Account. Yeah, we had our own account. And, and how big was the in house agency? Uh, it was one person, thank you. One person. <laughs> dad, you really should have been able to <laughs> help, help them out a little bit. Yeah, fair enough. Sometimes one and a half. One and a half. All right, I know how that goes. Um, so before the famous jingle that you all sang so beautifully, there was a, there was a slogan, two and a half, three acres of, mm -hmm. of magic. Tell me about the origin of that. Well, it, it, two and a half acres was when we had the original building. Right. And then when we added the extra part of the building, it went to three acres. I mean, you have to, you have to express yourself in terms that mean something. And we, you can say how many square feet it is. But if you're in Iowa and you want to convey the idea that it's yeah. large, you've got to use the terminology. Yeah. And acres was it. So they, they calculated it. <laughs> <laughs> and then for years and years and years, you would run full page ads mm -hmm. in, the, in the Gazette. Yeah. Uh, sort of a, a go big or go home approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the thing that you told us that, that was striking to me that other than car dealers, you yeah, were the were. biggest advertiser in the Gazette. That's yeah. happy, right? Yeah. And so if any of you are from the Gazette, I'm very sorry that the store closed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So 
tell me a little bit about the, the creative process. So if you're doing that all in-house, you're, you're doing design, you're writing copy, you're recording jingles, like how's all of that getting done? Well, you, know, you do get a little bit of help. Um, back in the day, everybody did do their own. Sometimes manufacturers would give us some help. Uh, we also, we would subscribe to newspapers and cities where people that we thought were similar to us uh, would obviously do the same thing. The furniture business is very visual. And so newspapers was a good uh, resource for us. And we also had the ability to look at other people's commercials. Um, a lot of our suppliers kept them so we could get inspired by them. So that, we just put it together. That's what you do. We just have somebody who made better business all day, every day to do that. Huh. Well, speaking as a quasi-marketing professional, I should say, speaking as a marketing quasi-professional, I will say <laughs> the ability to make Smulikovs into a word people sing that's, that's is a remarkable accomplishment. So good on you. Well done. All right. I have one more note because I love this story so much. Tell the assembled masses your Allegiant Airlines from Las Vegas story. Maybe Mike wants to tell it. <laughs> <laughs> What year was it when we were going to Las Vegas? We it, it was it was uh, early in the days of the Legion. It was of course direct to Las Vegas, and we were going to the uh, uh, Consumer Electronics Show, which is in January. Always an ominous time to do traveling from Cedar Rapids, and so we decided that we would go there. Uh, using this, and, and uh, there were the two adventures. Part one was uh, when we went there, and uh, they were a little bit late, but you know, they promised they'd get us there. Well, they took us there via Oklahoma City, I believe it. Was that right? I think it was Oklahoma. We spent the night basically on the floor in Oklahoma City waiting for a new plane. To, it, it's a long story. But, but the best part of it was we were trying to get home, and um, I'm, I'm not the world's greatest traveler, possibly I'm the worst, and, or close to, and I was ready to get home. And we were at the airport and they said, oh, you know, well, we'd, so we'd like to take off, but you know, the weather in Cedar Rapids is terrible, I don't know if we can do it, and, and um, I don't know if, if you'll be able to, you know, to land, and this and that. I, just, I took matters into I, We called Dennis Kelly and said, are the trucks out? And he said, oh yeah, we're delivering, there's no problem. So That's I right. said to the guy, are the trucks out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, so I told that to the uh, gentleman standing at the gate. Yeah. And I said, well, there's no problem in Cedar Rapids. We're delivering merchandise. We get out of the, <laughs> we're on the highway, we're getting into people's houses. There's no problem whatsoever. By a miracle, <laughs> We got to go. <laughs> Not that I didn't want to spend a lot of time at the Las Vegas airport, don't get me wrong. But um, we were, I, yeah, they brought us home. It was fabulous. I wish I, they, we could still get away with that kind of stuff. It's okay. We'll be fine. Just get us there. <laughs> I just want to be clear. Her family operated a furniture store that talked an airline. <laughs> into flying her home. Yeah, but they needed to get rid of this whole group of people. They had a lot of incentive. <laughs> because you're the worst traveler in the world. I'm the worst traveler. Yeah. I was the worst traveler. They had a whole room full of people and then another room full waiting to come the other way. So fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. All right, we're ready to turn it over to y'all. Uh, for the purpose of the recording, uh, and because there's a rock band, I, did you know there's a rock band across the street? Um, we will be repeating your question. So, uh, okay. who would like to start? I'm going to let. I'm going to give this to you. Oh. Yeah. Okay. okay. Did your family own the island that the store was on? Did your family own the island that the store was on? No, just the store. Just, just, just the, the store. store. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, we the, call it Maison because the lot was owned by. John May and, and, estate, and there were a lot of other yes. buildings or or I don't know about buildings, but there were a lot of other things going on on the island right. at the but time. To kind of clarify the environment that Spulikov started in is that it was at a time when Mays Island was much smaller and the only bridge that was crossing Mays Island was Third Avenue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Third Avenue was pretty much the center of Mays Island at the time. And so uh, the two sides of Third Avenue were lined with 
mostly small commercial buildings. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Swilikoff's operated one of these small right. storefronts, right. small wooden storefront. Yeah. And then behind these wooden storefronts, and this was 1889 and 1890, um, were people's homes. People are actually living on these islands, these little houses on both sides. So very, very interesting beginnings well, the, for the Smulikoff store. Yeah. The story is that uh, Henry Smulikoff walked into the building mm -hmm. in a rainstorm and uh, walked out owning the building, but he needed a, uh, a way to provide for a wife and family. And, uh, it went from there, and then we should clarify that that early building, which they did, Smolikovs did not build, but they occupied. Mm -hmm. Occupied the island store, yeah. Henry occupied, uh, was able to uh, walk in and then occupy it, mm -hmm. was uh, succeeded by a larger building that Smolikovs did build on Mays Island. Yes, after a fire, the original one burned down. It was a fire, and then mm -hmm. they built a three-story brick building that would have faced uh, Today would be the green space across from the county courthouse, mm -hmm. and it would have faced Third Avenue. Mm -hmm. What's fascinating about that building it was built uh, right after 1900, and of course they had an island furniture store painted on the side, Smulikovs Island mm -hmm. Furniture Store. Mm -hmm. And when Smulikovs sold their interest to the city mm -hmm. to develop the government island, the city had this vision of a city hall mm -hmm. on Mays Island, but this is 1908, 1909. We all know the City Hall Veterans Building did show up till 20 years later. So once Smolikovs moved over to 3rd Avenue West, guess which building became City Hall for Cedar Rapids for 20 years? Mm -hmm. The Smolikovs Building mm -hmm. on Mays Island was painted white, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. And uh, something that Smolikovs built uh, served a very important function in the early history of the city on Mays Island. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other questions? Yes, Margie. Still do. So that's your memory of Swilikoff's buying, mm -hmm. make sure we clarify this, Anne, buying it, 90 days, same as cash. We, we will still do that for you, yes we will. You'll um, still do that for us mm -hmm, today. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, very good. Mm -hmm. So, and then that, that, that's just your wonderful memory of the service and the, um, the, the expectations you had of Smolikoff. Yeah, yeah. Excellent all the way around, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah, Some, somewhere in our, in our store archives, we actually have a passbook that was, uh, that's in my grandmother's handwriting. Before she was married, mm -hmm. she worked for Henry, for her father, Henry, mm -hmm. at the store. And it's very interesting because it's got, basically the development of, this, of the family it started out, their first purchase was a bed, which they paid off uh, over time, and a, and a living room, a crib, and it, it went, sort of went on from there. Mm -hmm. it, but it, it, it was very interesting to see that 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 was the, the way that the store was used. That's the way it mm -hmm. developed. It was. Mm -hmm. Any other questions in the audience? Oh, I see a hand way up there in the back. Can't see you, but I can. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, the, uh, the connection of the Smolikov name with Lipsky? And Ann Lipsky, yes. Can we do the family line on how oh. it comes from Henry Smolikov? Henry Smolikov had four children. Mm -hmm. um, his uh, second child was. Uh, Ruth Smulikoff Miller, my grandmother, my mother, Joan Miller Lipsky, and that's the way it worked. Okay. Uh, other questions? Other question? Oh, we see one way up over up your hand. The questions are, the question was about how over the years from the beginnings of Smulikovs and through the years, the methods of payments, uh -huh. uh, the preferred method of payments, how they kind of evolved, what were the process for that as well? Well, it, clearly before there were credit cards, people paid in, in right. cash or with checks. Now uh, credit cards are very popular um, or automatic deductions, whatever. But the, the origin of, of Smulikovs, like most, uh, department stores of its time for making purchases that were sizable 
um, was that they granted credit. And they were often, the way you could get credit was by purchasing at a store like Smulikoff's or uh, whatever your local store was. Uh, so that we sold on credit with a passbook. The passbooks looked much like uh, a bank passbook might have looked, uh, where you would come in and pay a dollar or two dollars every week to whatever um, over a period of time. And that is, that is the way that most people made purchases, was using credit, especially for a store like Smulikoff, which was geared toward people for whom that was a real uh, opportunity mm -hmm. to, to uh, receive credit. They might not have a great deal of property or uh, mm -hmm. other ways of financing, so the store would give them credit. And that's, that is also how they got to carry sort of a diverse uh, set of, of, of objects. Uh, some stores carried uh, bicycles and we did boats and I mean whatever seemed like an interesting thing but people would, ex would expand their offerings because this was something that gave their customers the opportunity to purchase things that they might not have access to other ways. Could you clarify was there other, ever a Smulikoff credit card? Because so many of the other downtown apartment stores would have Armstrong's credit card. No, we didn't. It was, didn't we missed that. that. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. Any other questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Any other questions? Oh, right over here. Yes. question was for everyone can so everyone can hear it was when, when the time came to consider closing the store mm -hmm. was there uh, a situation where there was an opportunity for someone to offer to, to buy the store and keep the school of coffee name going at that point if someone would have offered me a lot of money for it I would have taken it <laughs> I thought it was I thought it was unlikely that anyone would want to keep the store um, as it was yeah. uh, it, it, there are already very, very few single stores of that size, mm -hmm. unless uh, someone ha would have been interested in making it larger, in which case they probably wouldn't have kept the Smulikov's name. Mm -hmm. And we, we did have some interest, in not, but it was not serious, and it was not, oh, it, it would not have perpetuated the Smulikov's type of a store. Oh. Right. Great questions. Do we have any more? Any yes, right. Yeah, Dennis. Yeah. Either that or we would have killed each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we mm -hmm. Right, this is a question from Dennis Kelly, who I, I can't imagine this call ever existing without Dennis Kelly. I don't think it could. Uh, right. Dennis, Dennis put in a lot of the work, so he speaks with yeah. authority. He sure does. Um, and, and he was talking about how there was so much work put into keeping Swilikoff's mm -hmm. going in downtown mm -hmm. Cedar Rapids. And we need to remember, as a, as a Cedar Rapids and Lynn County community, Swilikoff's was the last large-scale retail store. Uh, when mm -hmm. there were many mm -hmm. downtown, uh, not just yeah. furniture, but obviously department stores. Mm -hmm. So you're right, Dennis, great, as you just said to everyone here, uh, great care to keep it going, um, look at different options to uh, keep it as strong and viable. No, it was not. We, we made every effort to keep it going. Um, and uh, there, it was not that anyone was particularly opposed to closing it. It was just we wanted to keep it going as much as we could. It just became an impossible situation. It's it, you can't just move it in one day. It, it it's a huge deal. Yeah. So, yeah. We we received a lot of we received a lot of potential help, but it just the timing was not there. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes. Yes, Bill. I have a Lipsky story. Uh oh. <laughs> Mr. Nix has an Abbott Lipsky story. We'll try to relate it as best we can. So. Bill. And 
his head. Donald Trump are his arm. Six months later, he had been in the So that was he called the wife and said, Bring all your bills down and all your stuff. I'll see how you can do it. We're going to get through it. How are you going to get She did. She brought the mortgage, the car payments, the credit card, whatever. Yeah, I looked at him, and his secretary had him up on the end sheet. Wrote the check. Wrote the check. Gave it to him to write. That's my answer. Thank you, Bill. You're right. Still time for a couple more questions? Any other questions? Audience? <laughs> yes. Mark? Yes, I am. Yeah. Maybe before her time, when they moved into the building, there was an elevator in there. Because I remember going to that elevator that was operated by an operator. Yeah, no, right. Yeah. yeah, Alan Eggers asked about elevators in yes. Silver Coffs, yes. and uh, elevator when the store moved there, there in was. 1942, we had, you had mentioned earlier that uh -huh. 97 Third Avenue Southeast, the home of Silver Coffs from 1942 until 2014, uh, had previously been another furniture store, mm -hmm. Rosenbaum's, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly, and there was an elevator in the building already, and Alan was asking about Elevator operator. There was so an really elevator operator, and they sat on these little things, and they opened the gate, opened mm -hmm. the gate for you. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. No, I remember it well. That was there. How long did you? Do you remember how long you had an elevator operator in this small cost? That I can't tell you. I mm -hmm. just, I was young, and that was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to, so at some point, oh, Alan, yeah, we just had no, to push the button ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, and, we had, we yeah. had an elevator operator until very recently. We had switchboard operators. Mm -hmm that plugged everything in, messed everything up, and was just... I love it. Yes, question. In the 60s, somebody would walk you through the elevator, open the door, and push the button for you. I bet they were. Okay, she's remembering coming into Swilikos, being walked to the elevator, and mm -hmm. an employee of Swilikos would walk to you to the elevator, push the button for you, but then you had to get in the elevator and travel to the destination that you wanted mm -hmm. at that point. Uh -huh. if, if you were buying furniture and that happened to you, that salesperson was in big trouble because they were supposed to accompany you. Ooh. <laughs> but, Ooh. But, if, but if you were going to a different area, that, then that was appropriate. They was, so you could go up to the drapery or the uh, one time floor covering was on the second floor. And <laughs> that too. <laughs> That too. Your habit of browsing through okay. jewelry. I like Just that in case. Very much. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Do we have another question? The question was Did the Swinnacoffs and the other large retail stores like Armstrong's, Killian's, do business together? Am I stating the question correctly within the downtown area? Just, collaborations. Yeah, just to the extent that they all uh, were engaged in downtown promotional mm -hmm. activities. But never, in, there, our internal businesses were so different. Um, we never carried clothing or, uh, or, I guess for a while we did all carry small household goods, but that was never a major yeah. thing. Um, one of the, uh, of, the, of the things that we were all united in would be on downtown organizations, mm -hmm. and they all did work together with all of the, the downtown stores, which would have been at that time all the stores. Right. Um, mm -hmm. but, but that's about the extent of it. Okay. Oh, yes, over here, please. Yes, question. Go ahead. How long did Henry continue to be um, a Jewish person? Did he be totally involved in the store? And when did your father Abbott take over? And was there someone in between them? So you're asking how long was Henry Solikoff involved? Yes. Early on, how many years? And when did your father become involved? I think you mentioned something about right after World War II. Yes. And in between, I think we know which couple of people we're talking about that really were yes. there in those years. Um, 
Henry left Iowa in the 20s, and his two sons and his son-in-law, my grandfather, um, operated the store. Uh, he, yeah, and then after my father came, he, he worked for the store. He, he had, uh, had a banking experience was, was where he came from. And so he operated the finance area originally and sort of gradually took over more things, but uh, wasn't granted complete independence <laughs> for a long time. So um, uh, my grandfather died in the early 60s, but A.L. didn't die until the 90s. Yeah, right. and, and always had some kind of a finger on the family business, although not so much in the furniture so part of it. Oh, well, okay, we're going to take one more. How well did the business do during World War II? Uh, how did the business do during World War II? I, d I don't remember the figures offhand, although I have them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've, we have a lot of the old books that were saved from the flood. They were mm -hmm. on the fifth floor, luckily. And, um, and we did save them. Um, but since it was a growth period, I'm going to guess they did well. And uh, during times of economic distress, they were able to do some trading and swapping. I think that was not uncommon. Um, one of our famous t stories is the Grant Wood story that we have a picture that we got in return for a chair. And this, my mother had a fur coat as a young woman that was swapped for some, I forget what it was, but some household item. Uh, maybe a bed or something like that. Uh, so, but I would say during, during World War II, obviously there were restrictions with things, with uh, merchandise being available, but I think they managed to do well mm -hmm. um, because there was so much growth. Mm -hmm. So, and full employment, that kind of thing, so. Okay, oh, all right, well, okay, <laughs> we're, we're, yes, please. <laughs> Ooh, we want to talk about jewelry again. My grandfather loved jewelry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, his, his background was in sales and merchandising, which is how he got to Cedar Rapids in the first place. He was originally from Cleveland. He was a traveling salesman. And he sold uh, women and children's uh, ready-made uh, clothing, kind of like, uh, think like Buster Brown, that kind of thing. Um, and so he, he would travel to, uh, on the train around Iowa. And so Cedar Rapids was one of the places that he landed, met my grandmother. Um, and so that's, that's, he, it was his orientation. The, the Smulikoff boys were a little more business oriented. He was much more sales oriented. And uh, I had that personality. And uh, he loved jewelry, and he thought he could sell it. And, and that's how he had it. That was it. He used to go on, he would help with the buying, and he thought it was a great idea. And it was very common in a furniture store, again, the kind of item that you would need credit to purchase. And this is, that was what we really offered. Okay, and with that, I'd like to thank all of you for being here tonight. I would be remiss if I did not remind you that it is an important moment for the History Center. We are weeks away from opening the Douglas Mansion. It is the perfect time to become a History Center member. If you are not currently one, if you are currently a History Center member, please tell all your friends and your family that they should join as well. The Douglas Mansion is going to be remarkable and the full-time staff of the History Center uh, deserves all of our gratitude for keeping the organization alive during this interim period. Now, with that said, if you would join me in thanking Ann Lipsky and her backing band. <laughs> Oral Histories Live is an ongoing program of the History Center, so we will hope to see you at the next one. Thanks very much. Thank you.